What do you think is coming for stock markets in 2024? Not a pretty picture, but I think investors really should be prepared for the worst if you're not getting out of stock. If you want to be in stocks, I would recommend um, defense, energy, and mining. But I'd be out of tech, I'd be out of consumers, and I'd increase my cash allocation. I think I can keep this brief in the sense that a lot of what's going to affect the stock market is the geopolitical situation. So we talked about that in depth. Mm -hmm. But if you're just, you got a 401k and you're just buying the S&P 500 index from Vanguard or Fidelity and it's been going up and it has been going up, there's no question about that. And you're like, I'll just sit there and watch it go up. You know, be careful. We've been warning about a stock market decline for a long time. It's happening. You know, Wall Street's out to sell your stocks and CNBC says, you know, up, up, up. There's nothing I see that's going to make that better. I don't think the Fed's done raising interest rates. I remember the 1970s, the stock market peaked, Dow Jones peaked in 1969. It didn't get back to that peak until 1982. Now, okay, 1982 was the beginning of one of the greatest bull markets in history, grant that, but 69 to 82 is 13 years. It went sideways. Now, again, there's volatility and dips and peaks, and I'm not saying you can't make money, but I'm saying that there's a 13 year period when the stock market ended up where it started, number one, around a thousand on the Dow. But when you adjust for inflation, because we had massive inflation in the late 1970s, it was still down. That's 13 years. That's going to get worse because the US is heading into recession and we're maybe in a recession. Everyone's like, wait a second. <laughs> Yesterday, GDP was up 5%. And it was. It was up 5%. But it was very heavy on consumption and very heavy on inventories. Well, consumption, obviously, people don't realize when wholesalers and distributors build up inventory, that counts as GDP. Well, it's fine to build up inventory if people are buying the stuff. But if they don't buy the stuff and you're up to the rafters in inventory, you got to start writing it down. This is where you see, you know, you go to the gap and you get like 10 shirts and five pairs of jeans for 30 bucks. I mean, this is what happens. They slash prices. They do two for one sales. They just move the merchandise and particularly in certain areas stuff goes out of style you know the fashion industry is notorious you know who wants last year's coat or whatever so then the inventory situation comes down to the consumer are people buying stuff it looks like the consumers just hit the brakes a couple of reasons for that number one is during the pandemic you go back to 2020 2021 what was going on well starting with trump in i think june 2020 he gave everybody a 1400 hundred dollar check if you got a heartbeat you got a check and then trump did it again in december just before he left office it was another 600 hundred dollar check biden comes in and says, well, I can top that. And Biden does in February of 2021, right after he was sworn in, here comes another $1,600 check. Then there was Build Back Better, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is actually the greenest scam. We were running deficits of $2 trillion a year for about four or five years. The, the total spending was higher than that, but that was the deficit alone was about $2 trillion a year. Well, the Americans got used to that. Thanks for the check. And then there was the deferment on student loans. You didn't have to pay your student loans for about at least two years, maybe a little bit longer. And then when people got those checks, they saved a lot of it. So what happened in 2023? People drew down their savings. They, the savings rate got really low, like 3%. It was up around 13% during the pandemic. It's a little over 3%, 3.5% right now, which is low. They spent the savings they had. They didn't make new savings. And then they turned to the credit cards and ran up their credit card balances. Well, that feels good for a while. But then if you're paying the minimum and rolling over the balance and you're at your limit, your credit limit's used up and the interest rates are 20%, some of them are 28%, you're going to double that balance in three years. So if you're like, oh, I'll just pay the minimum this month and I'll figure it out, your balance is going up because the interest is compounding faster than you're paying it down at 25, you know, 20, 25%. People are tapped down on the credit cards. They've used up their savings. They're getting into a deeper hole because the interest is compounding faster than they can pay off the credit cards. And it's showing up in things like gasoline consumption. It's way down. The demand for gasoline is what economists call inelastic, meaning you just have to buy it no matter what the price is. You got to take the kids to school or get to work or go shut, whatever it is. You're just going to buy the gasoline, even if you don't like the price. By the way, lately, prices have been coming down a little bit, which is another, that sounds good, but it's actually a bad sign because it's disinflationary, which kind of leans in the direction of a uh, recession. But um, for gasoline consumption to drop, forgetting about the price, that means people are not driving. They're not going on vacation. They're not doing road trips. They're not driving any more than they have to. There are a lot of other signs. We don't have time to get into all the technicals with negative swap spreads and uh, inverted yield curves and, and all the rest. But it does look like the consumer slammed on the brakes. The stock market's starting to wake up to that fact. So I would say it's a pretty simple recommendation map. Reduce your exposure to stocks overall. Increase your exposure to cash. You won't lose money on cash, assuming that inflation is not bad, and it'll give you a lot of optionality. You know, you can go, if things get really, really, really bad, if you have cash, you can go shopping and find some bargains. But if you're in stocks and they go bad, you're just going to lose that money and never see it again. And if you do have stocks or some stocks, I wouldn't do the index funds. I would look at energy 
defense, not for good reasons, there's enough wars going on, but defense will do well, and mining because, uh, you know, gold and silver prices and strategic minerals will do well. So defense, mining, and energy are the sectors I'd be in. I'd lighten up on tech, get out of everything else, go to cash. Treasury notes look attractive here because interest rates are going to start to come down. I know they've been going up, I get it, but it looks like they've peaked and have turned around. So treasury notes, a uh, two-year note, a five-year note will perform very well, and they're very safe, obviously, and just take it from there. But you've got to be tuned into the geopolitics to understand the stock market. You can treat them as separate subjects, but if the world's falling apart, that's not good for stocks. I'm going to start with Ukraine. And the interesting thing about that is, of course, that war started, well, I would say it started in 2008 when George Bush declared that Ukraine should be a member of NATO. That was really the beginning of everything that's happened ever since. The U.S. was spent years kind of provoking this war. But the Russian special military operation started in February 2022. So we're about two years into this at this point. And I live in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'm here now and we got our share of conservatives, but it's a pretty liberal town. And there's a section, an older section where it's like all super liberals. And I remember in uh, the spring of 2022, everybody had Ukraine flags out. They took down their Black Lives Matter banners and put up Ukraine flags everywhere. And I just looked at it. I had an open mind. I don't like to jump to conclusions. And I saw that Ukraine is the most corrupt country in Europe, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. It's an oligarchy. It was a money laundering machine for the Democratic Party. We sent the money and they sent it back a lot of it in the form of campaign contributions. And a large percentage, maybe half the population are Russian speaking, really consider themselves Russians. And I said, well, What's so great about Ukraine that U.S. is supposed to go to the brink of World War III over it? But I kept an open mind. The more we went down that timeline, the more it was clear that Kiev, Ukraine, was just a corrupt skim operation. They'll take all the money we can give them, buy themselves houses in uh, you know Dubai or Miami or Switzerland or wherever, and you know fight to the last Ukrainian. Four hundred thousand dead. That's a conservative estimate. The actual number is probably higher. Just on the Ukrainian side, four hundred thousand dead for what? But everything about the war was misguided. The plan. If if there was a plan from the neoconservatives, the warmongers in Washington, the State Department, White House. Their plan was, we'll give them the money and the weapons, let them do the fighting. The Russians will come in, we'll bleed the Russians, we'll put sanctions on their economy, crush the ruble, you know, cut off their exports of oil, cut off their revenue, kick them out of the bank message traffic system, kick them out of SWIFT, freeze the assets of the Central Bank of Russia, and not only will the military be depleted, but the Russian state will have economic unrest, will be a popular uprising, they'll overthrow Putin and we'll march into Moscow. That was actually the plan. As ridiculous as that sounds, that's what they were thinking. It was never about Ukraine. It was all about defeating Russia, getting rid of Putin, and kind of running up a NATO flag over Red Square. None of that has happened. Everything about it was wrong and misguided at the time. And I said so at the time. I teach a course in economic warfare at the U.S. Army War College. You said I was a former advisor to the Pentagon. I guess I still am. They do teach this course, and I talk to people in the military on a regular basis. But I said in April 2022, that the sanctions wouldn't work, they would backfire, it would not hurt Russia, it would hurt us more than it hurt them, it would hurt Europe more, etc. And the Russian army was, they do get off to a slow start, but they finished the job. Anyway, all those things have played out exactly as I said. So they may unleash a complete missile bombardment from southern Lebanon that could hit major Israeli states, Haifa. I mean, I've been to all these areas. If they unleash this, then Israel will certainly fight back. So then you're going to have a two-front war. And this is where the U.S. might get involved, at least with air power. But here's the big question. Does anyone attack Iran? And there's good reason to think that we're at the point where the U.S. and Israel, and I would say the U.K., are in on this. So you know what? All the money, all the training, all the advanced weapons are coming from Iran. Why don't we just take Iran out once and for all? And by the way, they're getting very close to having nuclear weapons. This has been discussed for 15 years. But has the time come to you know sink their fleet, destroy their nuclear reactors, destroy their enrichment plants to the extent you can find them, you know, assassinate their scientists, and who knows what else? I'm not saying that's going to happen. Hopefully it doesn't because it's getting close to World War III, but that could be what happens next through an escalation process. You know, Gaza, Hezbollah, just take out Iran, be done with it. The problem is you can't just take out Iran. I kind of shrug. It's like, well, but then the Russians will come in. And what if the Russians are escorting supply ships to Gaza? Where are we now? I can stop there, but my only point is viewers and investors should not think of this as Israel attacks Hamas for revenge or counterattack or whatever. Yeah, that is going to happen. But this could escalate to something like World War III and nuclear weapons involved very quickly. So let's not forget about that. And China, they're watching the whole show. They're ramming Philippines fishing boats in the South China Sea. Why do we have a war in Ukraine, a war in Israel? and something close to war in the South China Sea and other trouble spots around the world, Syria, Iraq, etc. All of a sudden, you know, it's because two years of Biden and nobody's home and they're taking advantage of it. Everybody else in the world says, hey, here's my chance.
When we say bond markets, Matt, we have to be careful which bond market. I'm talking about the U.S. Treasury bond market. Short-term treasuries, you know, four-month bills, six-month bills, up to one year. From zero to one year, they're called bills. From two years to 20 years, they're called notes. And the 30 years is called a bond. So if you're an expert, you say bills, notes, and bonds, but they're all treasury securities. So I just want to be specific. We're not talking about corporate bonds, just to be clear, because those mm -hmm. may very poorly. If companies are going to underperform, we're going to go into a recession. You're going to see bankruptcies increase. Those corporate bonds are going to get hammered, but certainly junk bonds. So we're talking about U.S. Treasuries. The funny thing now is that the highest yields in the U.S. Treasury market are in like a six-month bill. Like, wait a second, shouldn't I get more if I buy a 30-year bond or shouldn't I get more if I buy a 10-year note? It's a longer maturity, more stuff can happen, inflation, you know, credit downgrades in the United States, you know, bank freezes, all those things can happen. I want a higher interest rate for my longer-term security. That's usually the way the yield curve looks. It's kind of goes upward sloping. The longer the maturity, the higher the rate. That's not true today. The highest maturities are right around uh, six-month bills, one-year bills, going out to two-year notes. When you get to the 10-year note, you actually get a lower interest rate, lower what's called yield to maturity than you do on a two-year note. So the interesting thing about two years is you get a high rate, but it's less volatile than a 10-year note. It's more liquid. I mean, 10-year notes are pretty liquid, but two-year notes are very liquid. So you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can have a shorter maturity, which means less risk in some ways, and a higher interest rate. So it's, like I say, the best of both worlds. But the highest interest rate is actually from six months to one year. So those are very, very safe securities, and they're paying between five and a quarter and five and a half percent. Well, yeah, Jim, that sounds good. But if interest rates go up even more, the answer is you're going to lose money on your capital. The value of the note or bond will go down if interest rates go up. That's bond math 101. Your rates go up, prices go down. The opposite is true. Rates go down, prices go up. So you can make it lose money, but that inverse relationship kind of throws a lot of people. But yeah, buying a two-year note that yields about 5.1%, very liquid, very safe, good return, more than your bank will pay you, more than most stocks will pay you. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, the answer is, if you think the two-year note is going to go to 6%, you might not like it because you're going to, you know, if you hold it for two years, you'll get your money back. But if you want to sell in the meantime, you're going to have a capital loss. So therefore, the next level of analysis is, well, what's going to happen to interest rates? Everybody wants to know that. In my view, they've peaked. They're going to come down. And if you like that action, you might prefer the 10-year note because a longer maturity, so interest rates come down a certain amount, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points or whatever. And I said bond prices go up, which they do. But how much do they go up? Well, the answer is the longer the maturity, the more they go up, they're more volatile. And so when I say risky, I'm talking about market risk. I'm not talking about credit risk. You are going to get your money back. But from a market risk point of view, if you had to sell it a year from now or six months from now, for that matter, if rates go up, you're going to lose a little money on the value of the note itself. But if rates come down, not only do you get the 5% interest rate, which is sweet, but you're going to have a capital gain on the note because that's what happens when rates come down. So the big question is, have rates peaked? And I would say they have. And I based that on what I said earlier about the economy. If we're going into a recession, we're going into a slowdown. We're looking at all kinds of geopolitical risks. Stocks are coming down. Then interest rates are going to come down too. The old cliche, which is true, you know, a week is a lifetime in politics. Well, that's true. I hate cliches, but that one happens to be true. A week is a lifetime. A lot of changes. And the answer I gave is like, well, we're doing this now because the election is happening now. There'll be election day in 2024, a lot of early voting these days. I guess it really starts in September, whatever. But the election is happening now because things are happening that are going to determine what happens by the fall of 2024 in particular. Meanwhile, the world's blowing up. By the way, those two things are not coincidental. A oh, war in Ukraine, war in Israel, something close to war in the South China Sea. Oh, gee, it's too bad we don't have a leader in the Oval Office. They're not unrelated. The world looked at, I call it the Chernenko moment. You have to be a Soviet Union expert. But in the early 80s, they had a president, a general secretary of the Communist Party, leader of the Soviet Union, named Chernenko, who was brain dead. Basically, sorry, I'm overstating. Not brain dead. He'd fall asleep in meetings couldn't talk. But then he died and they got another guy, Yuri Andropov, and then he died. And then somebody was like grilling and then they got Gorbachev and somebody asked Ronald Reagan, he said, why won't you negotiate with the Soviets? He said, they keep dying on me, which was true. But we, obviously the intelligence community knew that Chernyanka was mentally incapable. And it doesn't get better. If you know anything about progressive cognitive decline and the kind of diseases, there are no cures. There are treatments, but there are no cures. And then you die. And the Democrats know it and they know what's going on. Gavin Newsom met with Xi Jinping, who's the president of China. 
the, the head of China, the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. What does that tell you? It tells you that Beijing knows that Gavin Newsom is the most likely candidate for president of the United States in 2024 on the Democratic side, likely to be the next president. And there's a long history. Foreign leaders, if you're running for president, you're not the president, but you're running for president, you get meetings with foreign leaders. You'll go to Israel, obviously Canada, Japan, China, because they want to know you just in case you win. They don't want you win, you get sworn in, they don't want you to be a stranger. So that's not unusual. But the fact that Xi Jinping takes a meeting in Beijing with Gavin Newsom tells you that the Chinese are saying what I'm saying. I think it's entirely possible. It's not just a guess. I do think it's likely that Trump will be behind bars. Trump will be in a Fulton County, Georgia jail on election day. I still think he's going to be the nominee and I think he's going to win. So you're going to have the spectacle of you know Trump with orange hair and an orange jumpsuit, a prison jumpsuit behind bars in the Fulton County jail elected the next president of the United States. There's no prohibition on that, by the way. This is not impeachment. There is no prohibition on a convicted felon being elected president of the United States. There just isn't. It's not in the Constitution. They may have to give him a supervised release so he can go to the Oval Office. Um, Trump's going to be convicted of a crime. Now, he's got lots of grounds for appeal. Appellate courts may throw it out. It may get reversed. I understand all that. But he's indicted on like, you know, 90 felony counts or more in four different jurisdictions. But it's important to know that the world economy is slowing down. Germany is in recession. Japan is very close to it. UK, very close to it. Canada, I'm hearing nothing but bad reports, uh, housing market collapse, etc. China may not technically be in recession, but it's slowing rapidly. The thing with China, it's the second largest economy in the world. They've been growing at like 10%, 9-10% for over 20 years. When you compound something at 10% for 20 years, you're going to increase it by a factor of 10 or so over that time period, but not now. They're almost certainly below 5. They're going to print 5 because they make up the numbers if they have to. But when you strip out wasted investment, I mean, investment that you build a massive train station with 128 escalators and marble walls, but nobody goes there and the tickets are 10 bucks. You know, you can't pay for that. It doesn't produce any wealth. It just creates jobs. The real estate sector is collapsing. That's been the biggest driver. People are not stepping out to buy houses. They're not taking the bait. Lower interest rates haven't helped. China's in a massive slowdown. Whether it's technically a recession almost doesn't matter because when an economy that big slows that much, it drags the world down with it. So China's not going to save us. Europe's not going to save us. And one, uh, this is new, I'm going to throw another wild card here. It's a bit of a stretch to think the U.S. is going to dodge this bullet. If China's going slowing down, Germany's in recession, Japan's getting close to recession, Canada, UK, emerging markets, the whole world, plus what we're looking at in the Middle East, the idea that the United States is going to boom while the whole world is going down is just not true. Globalization may be uh, yesterday's news, but it's not over. Supply chains are still global. And uh, we're seeing a lot of problems in the U.S. The U.S. has been doing better than the rest of the world. The rest of the world's not doing well at all, and particularly China. And the U.S. is going to follow the world into this global recession.